Welcome to the GTN Show. Yeah, welcome. Today we have an update on the Malibu Triathlon controversy, AI making it onto bikes, maybe, and we have an update on the hardest endurance challenge in the UK. Yep, we also discuss a fascinating and troubling new medical discovery. Could worm blood be today what EPO was in the 90s? Hmm. And we have our competition winners from the Precision Fuel and Hydration Competition and a new competition with an exciting new prize. All right, start the show as we always do with React, some of the stuff we've noticed on the internet over the last week or so. It is kind of still the silly season, not much racing happening, but it's the start of a new year. That means some new team rosters are coming out and some new sponsors have been announced. And one of them that has been trickling out, they've been announcing pretty much an athlete a day, I think, is the Bahrain Victorious 13 uh, are announcing their team. Many old faces that we already knew about and uh, have re-signed with the team. Uh, so Lauren Parker, Arista Brownlee, Cat Matthews, Hayden Wild, Henry Schumann, Joe Skipper all have been announced already. And then a, a new signing, which is a pretty exciting one, and I think pretty well deserved because she's definitely on the way up, is Kate War. And they put this video on their social media of her being introduced to the team. Yeah, she's a very exciting talent, so I think that's quite a cool move by yeah. Bahrain. You think they're going to stop in her, do the laundry? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but as of filming this, we're yet to obviously hear the remaining athletes. Um, obviously, previously we have Cassandra Beaugrand, Daniela Reef, Vincent Louis, Georgia Taylor Brown, Holly Lawrence, and Christian Blumenfeld. Yeah. Will they be re-signing? Will they not? You Who don't knows? No. Yeah. I mean, Kate War has definitely taken one person's spot, and that's Jan Fredino is no longer obviously racing, uh, but we're not sure whether the rest of those are re-signed. We will find out in the coming days, I suppose. Yeah. Moving on, um, another athlete, um, well, out racing uh, this weekend in cross country, the USA track and field cross country champs uh, in Richmond, Virginia, is Morgan Cadwell Pearson, who narrowly missed out on the podium at see the USA national champs there um, in fourth place, which is... Wow, phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, the calibre of athletes racing that. So, yeah, hats off. Uh, watch this space. With yeah, him. he's stamped his ticket for Paris uh, 2024. So, uh, yeah, he's already in run good run form. So, watch this space. Uh, and then w more team slash kit reveal. This is a bit of a kind of spotted in the wild thing. We're not entirely sure what it is. Uh, but Team BMC are out doing their pre-season training camp and they've been spotted we we spoke last week about them not being in their normal kit that we've seen in the past but this time they're in ale kit by the way ale kit yeah <laughs> ale <laughs> uh, ale <laughs> i like that we should maybe i should rebrand as ale call it ale yeah, it'd be called ale in the <laughs> uk yeah um <laughs> Um, How do you know it's called LA? <laughs> uh, well, it just has a little uh, apostrophe above the E, but um, right. I haven't written okay, it in there, so probably, yeah, it's kind of my fault, really. Yeah. Um, but no, last <laughs> week, obviously, announced that, well, they showed the uh, photo of um, Clement Mignon in the wind tunnel wearing this unbranded, checkered, cross -hatched, uh, hatched um, design suit. Um, they previously were in Two Times You. They've got Ale on their cycling kit. Are Ale going to be the triathlon suit? Sponsor, I, I don't. Well, yeah. I haven't seen Ale do triathlon suits before, but that would be very exciting if they are. So yeah. watch the space too. And it's not called Ale, apparently. Then we've got a new one. Uh, Donna Urquhart set a new record for the longest polar run. This is a bit of a bizarre record, but hotly uh, contested, I've heard. Oh, did you? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah one thousand three hundred and twelve kilometers run in the Antarctic around a ten k loop. So not like run across the Antarctic. Uh, over 26 days, I imagine the hardest part of this challenge is actually getting 26 days of good enough weather to run outdoors in the Antarctic, right? Yeah, imagine having to run in a blizzard. Ugh. I mean, the winds in the Antarctic are like 100 miles an hour most days. So that's, a, yeah, it, I mean, it's very impressive, 1,312 kilometres. Uh, I'll, yeah, 
hats off, but I don't think we'll be challenging that one. No. Um, so it was cold enough when we did our marathons, yeah, and that was only well, like yeah. <laughs> minus one. <laughs> um, talking of weather and blizzards, um, obviously we discussed the spine race last week, arguably one of, if not the toughest endurance events here in the UK and possibly worldwide. It's really right up there. It's phenomenal. Um, it's now finished and we thought we'd do a little bit of an update. Significantly, obviously, Lucy Gossage, ex-pro triathlete and how she got on. Now, just a bit of an update. The Spine Race is an ultra marathon running event here in the UK. It's 268 miles and basically goes from Edel in England up to um, Kirk Home in Scotland following the Pennine Way. Um, what's really challenging about this race is it happens in the middle of winter, so literally starts in the middle of January, and it is brutal. I and mean, this year was actually the most brutal they've ever had. The lowest temperatures ever recorded, I think it got to minus 14 out there while the, while the athletes out there. In fact, they had to stop them at some of the uh, mm. aid stations. They had to just say, right, race pause, you, you may not leave this aid station because there is a blizzard out there and it's not safe, and hold them for a few hours while the worst of it passed before they let them carry on oh, again. Damn. Yeah. I have to have another right. cup yeah. of soup. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just to update on Lucy Gossage, she finished in third place, which is very impressive and kind of a debut of it. And I, by the sounds of things, it sort of all just came about by chance really she was off doing a bit of a hike in wales one point and then just like, she just accidentally stumbled onto the start line <laughs> yeah. Is it, you know? um, yeah. but in doing so she's raised um sixteen thousand four hundred pounds for the charity move against cancer charity which i believe she was bar- uh, behind sort of founding and setting up um but she did have a tough time despite yeah. uh coming in third place it took her oh well, nearly 24 hours just to complete the last 42 miles yeah, it all went a little bit sideways. Uh, lack of sleep kind of got the better of her. She said she was uh, all over the place. And uh, basically, she was falling asleep whilst walking. And then once she woke up, she had no idea where she was and how far she'd gone <laughs> or where the route yeah. was. Uh, had to kind of figure out where, what had happened. And then it would probably happen again. Um, and she went into a checkpoint, finally found a checkpoint. Uh, and it was one of the checkpoints you are allowed a maximum of 30 minutes at. And they were trying to get her to eat and drink and, you know, the normal things you do at check. She was like, I just want to sleep. All I care about is sleep. It's, I mean, when you're talking about the time that they were out there, and I guess sleep is part of the challenge. You have to sleep. But how much do you sleep? The winner, who, who smashed the record by 10 hours, uh, did just over 72 hours, slept for a total of 54 minutes Wow! in the whole 72 hours. So that gives you some perspective on what it takes to get through this race. And then we're talking running through blizzards and minus 14 degrees yeah. and not sleeping for three straight days. It is unbelievable and yeah. an amazing achievement by Lucy. And yeah, I think she's still raising money for that charity. So if you want to go onto Instagram, click the link on there and support it. Uh, as Mark says, 16,000 was the total when we recorded this, but I think it's still ticking up and you can, of course, donate to and also catch up on all those stories on what exactly she went through because it is gnarly. Uh, she, she said she did made pretty much every mistake she planned not to make, like forgetting Kit. She got to the start line and realized she didn't have her gloves. Oh, wow. Yeah, had Fine. to borrow some. <laughs> In the last I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you can ever be fully prepared for these sort of challenges. I mean, the no. stuff that, you know, over multiple days, um, you're always going to be presenting yeah. the stuff that will be a surprise, but... Oh, Probably don't abs- forget your gloves. Yeah, no. absolutely <laughs> okay. incredible. Hats off to Lucy. Yeah, yeah, very yeah, amazing. Um, and finally, another little um, sponsorship announcement. Um, we have mentioned this previously with Ashley Gentle signing with Win Republic, and she's been over with uh, the team doing a bit of fitting and getting prepped. Yeah, Ashley Gentle definitely... Focusing on those middle distance races, the PTO distance. Mm. And uh, yeah, this should be an announcement next week's show about this. Uh, yeah, stay tuned because that big calendar that we've all been waiting on tent hooks for is apparently coming out just next week. All right, now it's time for Try News. And starting with an interesting development on a story that Mark actually presented last week. This is the Malibu Triathlon and the... Super League owning it and then having the rights for it taken away. And now it appears that PTO is also involved somehow, which was, well, news to everyone, I think. Uh, Essentially, let's recap on what happened. Malibu Triathlon was sold to the Super League Triathlon just before the pandemic uh, in 2020. And they ran it all through the pandemic, obviously with multiple challenges during Mm. that that period. Uh, And now it turns out that at the beginning of 2023, 
They had to reapply for the permits to hold the race in Malibu from the city, and only two permits are granted every year by the city, uh, one for a running event, one for a triathlon event. And it turns out they were competing with the previous race owner uh, to get that permit back, and they lost that uh, that uh, competition to get the permit back, and they didn't get the permit. So essentially, they can't hold the race that they own now. They can't hold the Malibu Triathlon. <laughs> uh, and confused. the previous owner has now said he's going to hold the triathlon because he did win the po- permit to hold another triathlon. He can't call it the Malibu Triathlon because uh, Super League still owns the IP for that. Uh, but he is going to run another triathlon in the city and Super League are, well, out of luck, I suppose. Yeah. Um, now, Triathlon Magazine Canada have actually published an uncovered a whole new side to this story, which is quite interesting. As James has suggested, the PTO are involved. They've actually committed their support and $300,000 to the Zuma Foundation aid, which Michael Epstein, the previous owner of um, Malibu Triathlon, is behind and owns. Now, they, um, quote, assist in returning the Malibu Triathlon to its previous reputation as one of the most iconic triathlons in the world. Now, fair play to Tri Magazine Canada. They yeah. actually just simply requested some documents uh, related to the process from the city um, and involved or included in that was this letter from the PTO. From the PTO, Sam Renouf, uh, stating this, that they will financially back it, put $300,000 into it if they are successful to to recreate the Malibu Triathlon as it was, leaving Super League Triathlon pretty much high and dry. And the Super League Triathlon at the time, uh, they haven't quoted on this, they haven't been quoted on this specifically, but at the time when they lost the uh, the permit, said, we have asked the City Council many times for a meeting to discuss the criteria used in this process as we have been ready to satisfy any and all requirements but have not received a response. So basically they were saying, we didn't know what they needed from us, we asked them repeatedly and they didn't give it to us. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, this other guy was giving them exactly what he needed to give them, which was apparently a letter, included a, a letter from PTO, saying they would support it. Uh, and it gets murkier still because there's another quote from the actual councilman from the city, Councilman Bruce Silverspin did admit that the entire process was very weird as he tried to work through the dynamics of which companies were for-profit entities and which companies were truly local. The Zuma Foundation uh, of Michael Epstein had positioned itself as a non-profit organization, doing it purely for charity and not to make any profit. Uh, so even the 300000 from the PTO would be either used to run the event itself or as uh, for charitable donations, etc. So yeah, uh, obviously the Super League is a for-profit business, but it's all a little bit murky. And we're not really sure how this is all going to wash out. It looks like, uh, at the time being anyway, Super League Triathlon is out of luck and uh, there's going to be a new Malibu Triathlon called something else, run by the Zuma Foundation. And presumably, with PTO's investment and support, we may see an announcement for a PTO event. Yeah, interesting though, yeah. on those documents, there was nowhere that it mentioned a 100 kilometer middle distance event. It was only the Super League, the uh, original Malibu distances that were ever mentioned. So watch this space, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, moving on, and you may remember us talking about bikes caught up in freight jail. You might remember those bikes that were in the care of Tri-Bike Transport. They were bringing them back from Pontevedra in Spain where they had the uh, World Championships uh, event from World Triathlon. Uh, And there was a whole bunch of Americans bikes who were being flown back over, but then were held in freight jail, as Mark's called it, where they... uh, weren't, wouldn't be released by the by the freight company because bills had been unpaid by tri bike transport and basically were holding all these really expensive bikes that were owned by various triathletes as hostage until that was resolved. And there was uh, a whole debate really, wasn't there, around um, the legalities of the freight company holding the bikes because they're not legally tri bike transport's property. Yep. And F, yeah. So there's been this whole Controversy going on. Yeah, Yeah. anyway, the bikes have been released from jail, apparently, so an agreement has been reached. We're not sure the details of the agreement, who's paid who or how much. Uh, There are still various legal uh, claims going on. Uh, Basically, there was a 
class action lawsuit against them for holding the bikes by all the triathletes. There's also a claim by Tri-Bike Transport and there's a claim by the freight company. And yep, none of those have been resolved as far as I know. However, they have released the bikes. Uh, they are still, they've been shipped to a warehouse in LA. No word on how they actually get from the warehouse in LA to the actual owners of the Apparently, bikes. Well, from what I understand is it's now upon the owner of the bike to go and collect or arrange shipment from yeah. that warehouse. It's not exactly the deal that they signed up for when they signed up with Tri-Bike Transport, but uh, yeah, at least their bikes are on their way back to them many months after they were shipped. Uh, yeah, uh, the, apparently an agreement has been reached to get the bikes to the owners, but no word exactly when that's actually going to happen. In the if, next you few are, days. if you are affected by this, um, do let us know in the comment section down below how you're getting on with it. And um, I thought any you were going to say, it. if you are affected by this, there, we will leave the helpline on the bottom. Oh, maybe so, by this for point, we support. probably should set up a helpline for this because I do feel really sorry for uh, yeah, people. Yeah, well, if you're missing your bike for that long, yeah. you probably do need counselling and support. Unfortunately, we don't have a helpline for that. You'll have to look somewhere else. I'll put James's uh, personal number here. No, <laughs> don't. Now it's time for What The Tech. And starting with an announcement by our trainer partner, True Kinetics. They've just launched the first direct drive trainer that connects directly to your TV. Oh yes, the True Trainer 8.2 still has some of the other features on the previous 6.2 trainer, but now also comes with a USB, HDMI port, and a built-in battery. So through that HDMI port, we're now able to broadcast your live training data onto a TV screen. So things such as your power, your cadence, onto the TV screen whilst you're riding along. Also, we have that built-in battery allowing cord-free training, which is pretty cool. And also, able to charge devices whilst you're training. Why it's not saying fast charging, though. You want to just up it a little bit, James? Cheeky. And it's your lucky day because we have one True Trainer 8.2 available to win in our GTN True Kinetics giveaway. To enter into the competition, follow the link in the details below. And whilst you're at it, you can check out their limited time offer of a 150 euro discount on the new True Trainer 8.2. Well, back to set, James, and on with more tech news. This bit's pretty cool. Using AI and machine learning on our bikes so that they make decisions for themselves. Yeah, this hasn't actually been invented yet. But a patent has been filed by Shimano uh, to this effect. Essentially, they've got this learning module that you can mount on your bike in the patent that it's got a little screen on the front handlebars and it can learn when you adjust your front suspension, when you use your dropper seat post, when you adjust your saddle tilt, obviously all things for gravel bikes and mountain bikes, not so much triathlon bikes, but it will learn when you do that, and then the next time you go through that same place, it will automatically do it, and you can give it feedback the whole time with like and dislike buttons. I mean, I can see a few issues immediately <laughs> with that. Uh, a lot Gnarly of it requires, trail. requires manual feedback of like, yeah, that was good. I'm glad you dropped the seat post then. Whoa! Yep. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> or then, yeah, crawl back to your bike after you've stacked it and go, dislike, didn't, didn't like that adjustment. Yeah, uh, but obviously it's not so specific for triathlon, but it does kind of bring the question of, you know, our bikes could get brains on them that can think and adjust things and potentially in the future change gears, uh, preempt when it needs to change gears, that kind of thing. I mean, uh, presumably it is um, by working automatically, if you're just doing a big long loop, it will start to learn that, all right, when the bike's at a certain tilt, yes, and so now I need to drop the dropper by this much at this point and I need to change this. That's pretty cool. Also, what you can do is with a pre-programmed loop, um, yeah, perhaps you're doing a cross-country course, like multiple laps, and you configure or say you want the dropper down at this point or the suspension, it will do that the same every time so you don't have to worry about buttons, it's just happening. I don't know how new this is. I mean, I had Megura suspension on my mountain bike many, many years ago that was automatic. It was electronic yeah. and you turned it on and if you tilted your bike a little bit, it uh, softened and if you tilted your bike back a little bit, it But stiffened. this is going to learn your preferences and right. it will be adjusting as you go. I mean, I prefer when it goes downhill to soften and when it goes uphill to <laughs> stiffen. It's not that complicated. I don't know. Well, we'll see. Uh, apparently, Shimano has filed this patent, so uh, maybe they're making it in the works. Many times patents are filed and it never actually turns into anything, so we'll see. We'll see. Well, moving on, and oh, who saw this coming? Using worm blood for doping. 
Wormblood seems like the bad guy in a movie. <laughs> All right, this has made a blip or maybe a big flashing red light on the World Anti-Doping Agency's radar. Does the use of extracellular hemoglobin from the Arenicola marine lugworm. Ooh. Yeah, if you didn't know, that is a common sandworm that is found on beaches and used to fish for cod. Yeah, well, very interesting. Thanks for that knowledge. Yeah. In 2007, marine biologist Dr. Frank Zhao, it's a cool name, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, discovered the lugworm hemoglobin 250 times smaller than human hemoglobin and also capable of carrying 40 times more oxygen. So, Zhao obviously immediately saw medical usefulness of this, um, but also potentially for performance enhancement. Yeah, obviously the holy grail for endurance athletes is the rapid and efficient delivery of oxygen to the working muscles. And this is obviously extremely efficient at doing, doing this. And in fact, Dr. Frank Zell has admitted that in 2010, 2020, a professional cyclist has approached him to find out if they could get some of this substance. Yeah, now his company, the Hermarina, Hermarina his company, uh, on their website actually lists advantages over other blood substitutes. In addition to super oxygen transport, uh, lugworm hemoglobin can be stored at room temperature, is compatible with all blood types and doesn't cause elevated hematocrit levels or blood pressure. It's like it was made for the dopers. It's pretty unbelievable. It also has an amazingly short half-life, uh, which they know from animal stu studies, uh, of like four to eight hours, which I suppose can be an advantage or a disadvantage. The disadvantage being that when you started an Ironman, it probably still wouldn't be working at the end of an Ironman. The advantage being that even if you used it in 70.3 before you started, by the time the race was finished, it would no longer be detectable. In fact, they've done studies on this and it is, would, the window for detection by anti-doping authorities would be like four to eight hours and then it would be gone. So, uh, yeah. That'd have an interesting pacing strategy on an Ironman, wouldn't you, to make, make the most of yeah. it in the first half? Four to eight hours. You have to do a sub eight hours. Otherwise, uh, yeah, you're, it's like one of those uh, superhero pills or something where the effects just wear out and you turn into a little skinny guy again. What is it, Banana Man? <laughs> yeah, Banana Man. Yeah. He ate banana and he, he got really strong right. for a little while. Anyway, I, I digress. The point is, this is a little bit worrying. If mm. I mean, we don't really know how prevalent this is. Who knows about this? Uh, as he says, he was approached in 2020 by a professional cyclist. That's nearly four years ago now. That's, but that's just his company and that's, that's capable of doing this. Exactly, and obviously, yeah. this has been flagged to the WADA, or World Anti-Doping Authority. And so... They are clearly observing yeah. and monitoring this. Could um, this be the tip of the iceberg and this is the, the lugworm blood is the EPO of the 90s where we finally find out that a whole bunch of people have been using lugworm yeah. blood I, for a while. I don't think it works with earthworms, so don't go fishing around in your garden. <laughs> Although, maybe that's a GTM yeah. video for the future. GTM does science. Does earthworm blood work the same as lugworm blood? Mark's going to find out for us. <laughs> No, we're not doing that experiment, no ways. <laughs> right, well this is a neat little product that I've been wanting to feature on the channel for a while, but I've been waiting to get it in my hands to show you guys. It's the Squeezy, or Squeezy? Sque there seems to be an extra E in there, Squeezy. squeezy. Um, now this is not just any ordinary bottle, no. Because if we take it apart... It's like an infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually got a little flask inside that can store gels. I think you get between three to four gels in here. So not masses, but enough. Um, and that goes inside. And you're wondering probably how does this work? Well, we get fluid in around this and we've got a little tab on the top here. We can switch between fluid and gels. So rather than having to take out gels or having loads of rubbish left afterwards. You kind of got it all there, ready to go. You can have a bit of both on the go. Pretty cool, isn't it? it I mean, I think it solves a problem that wasn't a problem, but... I've... I think, it, I mean, I'm not saying like, for an Iron Man, obviously you're still gonna need gels and various other things, but I think that's quite a neat idea for just sort of decluttering and just keeping everything in one place. I imagine it's very useful for a pro cyclist who's getting their bottles directly from yep. the team car and they can go, just give me a bottle and it's got gel or water and they can swap between the two and take as much as they want of either. Yeah, yeah. I, maybe less so for your everyday triathlete who needs many, many gels over the course. No, of I think it's cool. It's available in um, 550 and 750. Obviously, this is the smaller one. And also, um, 
Well, I think there's maybe a third function to this because we've got two tabs here for switching between gels and uh, fluids. And maybe if we go somewhere in the middle, then the after party, we can have yeah, vodka, vodka in the Coke. vodka in the small one and Coke in the other one, or, yeah. the, other way, or the other way around, depending on your taste. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, neat. Check it out. Um, oh, it's I, cool for triathlon. Yeah, useful. On to our competition winners. We had a competition a couple weeks ago with Precision Fuel and Hydration, and you could win a $250 voucher, gift card, plus a video consultation with them so that you can get your nutrition strategy for whatever race you've got coming up perfectly dialed. And our winners for that competition are, drum roll please, Jose Afonso, Guion Mujeres, and Zolt Siket. Congratulations, all three of you. Uh, you guys obviously will be able to arrange with PFNH when you have that video consultation and your voucher is on its way to you. And on to race news and we just one race. Some. Yeah, <laughs> just one race this week. Oh, uh, from New Zealand, the Taranga Half. Yeah, uh, so Javier Gomez was racing this one, Ooh. which is exciting. We always excite when Javier Gomez is racing. Unfortunately, Javier Gomez had some uh, mechanical issues. Apparently his handlebar had some issues and he had, was forced to DNF. He is definitely having a run of bad oh, luck. He yeah, must have obviously DNF'd at, uh, I'm in 70.3, Topol. Yeah, he is, uh, must have run over Black Cat or something because he just cannot get back to racing <laughs> of his old form. Uh, anyway, in his stead, Jack Moody took the, took the uh, title there on the men's side ahead of Mark Phillips with Ben Hamilton rounding out the podium. Yeah, and on the women's side, it was Hannah Berry that took the win there ahead of Chelsea Sadara who... Posted a phenomenal run split, 118, a good six minutes ahead of the next run. Not enough to overcome a less than stellar bike. Yeah, losing five minutes great. There. Um, yeah. And Elsbissa rounding out the podium. Good to have some racing back again. Oh, yeah. Now it's time for our pin board. We take a look at some of the stuff you guys have sent in. And this month, because it's January, and we're all trying to keep fit slash get fit slash get through the winter, uh, we're asking for your pictures of your pain cave, you suffering indoors, whatever it might be. Uh, some people have sent in really cool photos of their pain cave. Some people, they're very utilitarian setups that they are struggling their way through in winter, waiting to get back out into the sun and everything in between. We are actually doing the Zwift 30 in 30. That is 30 minutes of exercise on Zwift every day for 30 days in January. Yes, we know there are 31 days in January. You can take the last day of January off. But uh, if you want to join us for any of those, they're on Zwift. Join the GTN club and and you can join us on those rides every day uh, this week uh, until the end of January. So yeah, we'll, Mark and I will be out there and Heather for some of them. Right, uh, right on to what you guys have sent us. First one from Artyom um, in Switzerland. And what is this quite a cool pain cave, isn't it? So yeah. he said he's got some updates for my not only indoor training setup. So he's got a new bike, the Speedmax CFR, professionally fitted. Got some saddle and aero bars for the kicker bike, which he's currently on, as you can see in the photo. Um, and he's copied the TT position with millimeter, millimeter precision so that you can ride indoors. And bonus point, my pain cave also works as my work from home office. And he's also sent in a video of him training away there. Very, Very cool. impressive. Very yeah. nice. Next one we have from Charles, uh, and he's in Petworth, West Sussex. And he says, steaming away in two degree temps while I cool down from a brutal 30 minute threshold HRTT effort. I apologize for the state of the pain cave. You can't see the other half of the garage full of sofas, etc. while we do work on our house. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> yeah, normally yeah. the way, isn't yeah. it? Excuses, excuses. 2011 Cavendish jersey on the wall, a nod to the cycling I love while I trained for my third Ironman in Copenhagen in October. Well, good luck with that hey. training. You definitely got a good jump start on that training if you yeah, train for a race luck. in October. Um, and next one from Laura um, from her living room. Uh, me riding my bike on the trainer in the living room, watching TV with my husband who is recovering from foot surgery and also. Our cat is snoozing on him. Well, it looks like he's snoozing as well. <laughs> yeah. And then we've got John from uh, Palmetto, Florida in the USA. This pain cave was built so my girlfriend and I could ride together two of everything except GTN videos for inspiration. Only, only need one of those. Uh, it also doubles as my YouTube studio. Really cool. Yeah. Fellow YouTuber. Yeah. There he is. Um, and final one, I believe it's the final one, isn't it? From Beth um, in Chester, the UK. Love the GTN shows for all my indoor training. Currently feeling mega jealous of all <laughs> Seems the Seems lovely... like the polar opposite of the first one, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, feeling mega jealous of all the lovely pain caves being shown on the show. But wondering, am I the only one who doesn't train in such salubrious surroundings. Thought I'd share what I'm dealing with, all the layers required initially because it's so cold and damp, surrounded by clutter, lawnmowers, golf clubs, tins of paint, old broken bikes, <laughs> general garbage junk, not to mention 
the spiders. Check out the webs behind me. Nice. <laughs> well, I mean, if your pain cave looks more like Beth's and less like uh, Artyom's, then uh, yeah, send us in those yeah, photos. We'd like to quite see real. Too. It's uh, utilitarian. As long as you can get it done, no problem. As you, know, you get the training done and you don't have to go out in the snow and rain and ice, then uh, what's the problem? Yeah, good on you, Beth, for getting yeah. it done. Uh, remember, send those photos in. Use the uploader on screen right now. We'd love to see your pain cave in action. Say what? Alrighty, we've got some good comments, particularly under our Junk Miles bike video. Yeah, if you haven't seen it earlier this week, a little video came out where Mark and I discussed whether spending all day on your weekend doing a long ride is actually worth it or whether you can just forego the long ride entirely in your training. Now, this actually had some surprising, we, we were like, we're going to get people who are going to have an opinion on this for sure. And it's turned out that actually most people or the opposite opinion. We were like, a lot of people are going to be like, you can't train without a long ride. You need a long ride. And a lot of people are actually like, eh, I could take or leave the long ride, but I really do enjoy the long ride. I'm not looking for reasons why I don't have to do a long ride. I'm actually looking for excuses to get out <laughs> and do a long ride. So these are a couple of them. Uh, the Zool says, my long rides are a lot less about training, a lot more about exploring around and enjoying myself in my free time. Yes, I need them. Not everything needs to be a means to a PR in a race. I'm just happy to be out on the bike, loving my long rides. I do them three times a week if I have time. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah so, fair enough. Uh, our um, argument saying you, sh you, you don't really need them is out the window. Yeah, and from Matthew <laughs> Krillman, um, for me, the thing at the end brings up the more relevant question. If you really like going for a long run or ride on the weekend for its own sake, where do I set the upper limits? Oh, Ooh. yeah, that's another whole debate entirely. But yeah, uh, we, were, we were kind of worried that you know a lot of people are going to be like, this is the staple of my program. I have to do a long ride. And it turns out that most people just really, really want to do the long ride. That is the reward for yeah, the whole yeah. whole week of training. So, uh, word of warning, if you have a significant other who is constantly trying to not get you going out for a long ride, don't let them watch that debate that we had because uh, it might give them some reasons why you don't need to do it and you don't want <laughs> them to see that. <laughs> yeah. I know, it's good though. But yeah, please keep the comments coming in under all our videos. Um, get stuck in, um, share your opinions, and we do also get involved in the comments as well. So love to build that community. Yeah. And, uh, coming up on the channel later this week, uh, I did Daniela Reef's hardest bike And workout. how was it? It was pretty hard, yeah. Yeah, it did it out in the south of Spain, up and down a pretty big hill. Up and down a pretty big hill, many, many many times yeah. anyway that video is coming out later this week so enjoy that if you're looking for something to watch right now we did a pretty interesting heart rate explainer why your resting heart rate is as low as it is or not as low as it might be uh, and the whole explainer is quite interesting and yeah. yeah and also if you're looking to design and structure a training plan we have also got a video on that uh, yeah. to help you with just yeah, the season for planning all your, out. your training program isn't it yeah, yeah. it certainly is <laughs> thanks uh, for watching everybody we'll see you again next week